Great. Well, good morning and welcome everybody to uh, Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And uh, we're continuing our updates on the impact of uh, COVID-19 and uh, our witnesses are not given much time today. So I'm, I'm going to um, stop here uh, so I can welcome Mark Hughes and we'll ask witnesses just as if we were at the State House to please identify yourselves for the record. And um, welcome, Mark. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, um, committee. And uh, thank you so much, Mike, for setting things up and holding it down. Um, shout out to Falco over there as well. Um, wanted to just take this, the brief moment to just, ch just check in. Madam Chair, I really appreciate uh, being uh, offered the opportunity to do so. We, I've been over to um, Senate uh, GovOps just at the end of last week to do something similar. I'm just uh, coming off a call with uh, corrections and institutions uh, just a little bit ago. And we're kind of bopping around trying to update folks and tell you uh, what's going on. You probably noticed uh, on the news today and you're probably gonna hear increasingly and we're gonna, re we're gonna be uh, releasing some, some stuff as well is, is that even though the data is not in uh, completely, um, what we're seeing is increasing, it's, it's becoming increasingly clear that African Americans are certainly dying at higher dis and much highly, uh, higher disproportionate rates of uh, COVID-19 uh, and uh, that uh, we're getting reports in from Milwaukee, uh, Michigan, uh, Illinois, uh, North Carolina, New Orleans. Um, we're, we're seeing this, uh, this is not, um, you know, too much of a surprise. I think a lot of folks have forgotten uh, that the, um, before the pandemic that we're already operating in a health system that delivers disparate outcomes uh, for black folks. Also, uh, African Americans are much more likely to suffer from underlying conditions like heart disease, hypertension, asthma, high blood pressure, HIV, to, say, to name some of them. Uh, and also with median uh, wealth disparities already at 13 to one uh, white to black, it shouldn't be hard to understand uh, why blacks are, are underinsured, underemployed, uh, and also more likely to work in service industries, uh, essential uh, workers as well, and also um, likely uh, not to be able to work uh, from home. Did I say, hi, my name is Mark Hughes and I am for the record. Did I say that, William? Uh, Senator, no, I don't know. So uh, hi, uh, Representative, no. My name is Mark Hughes. I am for, with Justice for All, sorry. Okay, so um, so yeah, so we're, we're bouncing around and, and you know, given, um, 10 minutes to have a conversation on the impact uh, that this is having, uh, you know, judiciarily or otherwise, and also, you know, more poignantly, uh, being focused to just narrow this narrow conversation about judiciary uh, is, as you could imagine, uh, uh, Representative Christie is probably a little bit um, challenging. Uh, what um, Senator uh, White offered to us was an opportunity to come back with some of the other impacted uh, uh, groups like uh, Migrant Justice and, and others. And she, I think we have two hours on the calendar later in the week uh, to come back and really have uh, Representative Birded a, a real conversation about, you know, what are all of the impacts. Uh, what I'll do is, is just today, uh, in the interest of time and hopefully with the expectation that, uh, Madam Chair, that that could possibly happen in the future with us here, is, is just to kind of spare you uh, all of these details and just assure you uh, that we are um, working from multiple angles as the um, as uh, Justice for All, as well as the Racial Justice Alliance, and I will just share a couple. But before I do so, I'll share with you just some high level principles and tenets that we're trying to operate from. Uh, that is one of transparency and one is also of access. Um, now, <clears throat> from our perspective, um, these are you know challenges that are also pre-existing. Um, it's a um, interesting conversation because uh, in the medical system, we use these terms pre-existing condition. Um, there are numerous pre-existing conditions that uh, communities of color face uh, as we come into this COVID-19 crisis that are being uh, exacerbated on all fronts. And uh, I can assure you uh, that there are many things that keep us up at night. Um, one, one thing that I wanna talk about is a little bit about public safety. Uh, mostly because I'm, I am where I am right now in judiciary. Uh, there, are, there are numerous implications of, um, you, know, you know, again, we are coming from a place pre-COVID where we were already ask, asking the question, um, who's safety? When you say public safety, who are you really trying to make sure is safe? Uh, so we, we bring that into the conversation. 
when you start talking about the implications of um, you know, balancing public safety with public health, as well as over, over, overarching um, and overarching equity uh, kind of uh, component of that, you know, at our borders, in our communities, uh, you know, nobody's talking about um, uh, SPAC or the Burlington Police Commission here. Where is the oversight? Uh, I am a commissioner. I've, you know, I, I have an email into our mayor here because we'd like to find out, you know, when are we going to meet again? So there are a lot of implications, uh, racial, um, there are a lot of civil liberty imp implications, you know, there are additional citations that are being, um, being levied. Uh, there's a disconnect, obviously, with communications where some of our youth are still out there. Uh, you, you have an already poor community that are being cited for, for violations. So there are a number of implications uh, that, that need to be discussed surrounding so-called public safety. Uh, that you know that also that that tie into uh, travel restrictions. Um, point two, uh, we we spent uh, quite a bit of time with our partners at the ACLU uh, working uh, to uh, to get folks out of the criminal justice system. I just told you I came off a call just recently um, uh, over this last hour with institutions, with corrections and, and institutions, because they're taking a look, um, Madam Chair, as you know, at S three thirty eight. So. You know, there are, again, a lot of implications when we have folks who we know who are already disproportionately incarcerated. And we know that um, from um, looking around the nation that we have um, Petri disc dishes just waiting to explode. Uh, and we, you know, so there are, and, and plus we also understand that, you know, again, African-Americans will die more frequently uh, when exposed uh, to this disease. Uh, so we've got some concerns uh, in our prisons. Um, and, and I think I'll leave you with this last one and then I'll just mention just from a very high level some of the other things that we're looking at and why it might be a good reason for us to come back and have some conversations with you. Um, and this one is, is really uh, voting. Uh, we know and understand, uh, as, if, if you're watching the news right now, you can see a, a pretty good uh, circus act going on in Wisconsin right now. Um, if you haven't seen it, you'll see it before the end of the day. Uh, and, uh, you know, the implications surrounding uh, what is going on in uh, Wisconsin, surrounding voting today on this day of prim primaries, uh, as it pertains to us, communities of color, uh, cannot be overstated. Uh, so uh, we're very concerned about, um, you know, not just that aspect of it, but also just the communications aspect of it. And that is to say, if you're changing the laws that relate to voting or for that matter, public meetings or anything else, it is critically important that that information reaches everyone. Um, <clears throat> I think, and this is only because it, it looks like, you know, I actually have two and a half minutes left, which is kind of a surprise. Um, I'll, I'll just briefly mention um, just racial disparities, uh, in, just the racial disparities around technology and education because we know that all of our children are out for the year. And we also realize and understand that they're going to be reliant upon uh, technology. And that means not just the platform itself, not just the internet connection, but also you know, having that skill set or, and or their parents having those skill sets as well. Uh, so again, deeply concerned with those disparities that exist uh, in uh, uh, technology and education. Uh, briefly, from a very high level, um, Rent and mortgage moratoriums, uh, looks like we're headed in the right direction on that, but why it is we had to fight this hard and this long to get there is befuddling, but we'll continue to fight. Um, a little bit about uh, domestic violence. Uh, very, very concerned about uh, where, where we're going, uh, you know, at, with a, you know, a disconnected uh, society, uh, folks who are, um, um, at home more as families uh, and some of the things that can come out of that and particularly uh, as it relates to those uh, of us uh, who are, you know, who do have the ability to, to be at home. Um, I wanna just go back and say- um, About one this, minute, Mark. This whole thing about, um, this whole thing about this, these, uh, thank you so much, uh, Representative Burdick. Uh, this whole thing about where we are right now has everything to do with economics, everything to do with economics. You know, at a, 
you know, with the median wealth of, of a, the average white family being about uh, 13 times that of a black family, all of these other issues are exacerbated pre-COVID-19. So as we go, as we move into this COVID crisis, you know, in addition to our health being on the line, there are many, many other factors that are being exacerbated. So as this 1.5 or $2 million or $3 million or whatever it is is coming down to the state uh, as it's coming here, um, you know, if there's if there's 4.5 percent of people of color in this state, then you know it would be expected that somehow or another that there'd be 4.5 percent of that money being allocated to those folks, or maybe even uh, higher proportionately. Uh, some of the, some of this needs to be worked out in ways to where um, uh, economically uh, those conversations are being had, and that in addition to all of the things that I've mentioned, that they don't that we're not standing at the back of the line when it comes to uh, economic dissemination as well. So I thank you uh, for your time today. I hope uh, that in the future, we would have more than 10 minutes to come back and tell you the, the big, give you the big picture and tell you the whole story. Um, it's unfortunate, but understandable uh, that I uh, would have to come here and, with, and be limited to a, a 10 minute period to tell you as much as I, that, that you, you actually really need to hear uh, about this very, very serious uh, situation that's impacting communities of color here uh, in the state. But I am definitely appreciative of the time that you've given us. Um, I'm open to any questions that you might have. Uh, and I, again, thank you committee for your time and thank you for your work. I've been watching you. I thank you so much for the hard work that you guys are doing in these trying times. Um, thank you, Mark. And, and this is just the beginning of the conversation with, with you and many others. And uh, we do look forward to definitely having you coming back and, and hearing from you. Um, any questions? We can take a minute or so for questions. Looking for hands. Uh, Selena. Selena. Yeah. You're on mute. Sorry. Hi, Mark. You're just. Hi, uh, Representative Comer. Somehow extra, like, poignant to see someone who you know is really physically close to you these days. Um, so I'm curious if you have any more information about um, some of the civil ticketing that's happening. I know that, you know, the mayor in Burlington announced that they were going to do civil ticketing. I'm not sure if that's being mirrored in other parts of the state that you're aware of and and whether um, you you have already started to hear about interaction interactions of concern with local police but um, that that is definitely an area of concern for me and so if you have any more information to share about that now or or you know, if you want to follow up with me too I'd definitely like to hear anything you have to share well, well, every every issue that we that we'll be bringing to you and that you that you are hearing about, you know, with the exception of folks dying uh, at disproportionate rates from this particular uh, virus, are all pre-existing conditions. So we 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 went into this crisis, you know, already with concerns about uh, disproportionate civil ticketing, uh, because it is a fact here in Burlington and it is a fact across uh, the, uh, the state. I had indicated previously that, you know, this is an economic issue. When you start talking about 400 years of systemic racism, that's what we're talking about here, okay? That's what that 13 to one disparity is really all about. Uh, so I just wanna emphasize more than anything, the impact uh, that, you know, civil ticketing has on an already exacerbated situation. Uh, so no, we haven't really heard about, you know, these issues, you know, prevalent uh, across the state only because you know, we're also shut down and disconnected. We don't have the transparency and access that we need right now in order to do so because of the so-called uh, public safety. So, um, so this is the challenge. You know, it's the same challenge that we face uh, with the uh, the safety, the health commissioners uh, not collecting race data on deaths because we don't know the issue. You can't make data-driven decisions because we don't have the data. Uh, I don't know, that probably didn't help you very much, but we'll continue to look and I, I'll, I'll close the loop with you out of band. Okay, great. And I, uh, Barbara, do you have your hand up? Yes. Okay, all right, we'll take um, Barbara's question and then, and then we do need to move on. Thank you. Hi, Mark. Hi, Representative Rachelson, how are you? I'm well, thank you. It's really good to see you. Good to see you too, it's been a long time. 
So I'm wondering when you come back, um, if you also would be willing to make um, recommendations as to actions that you think we can take, um, especially on a short-term basis in order to address some of the issues you're mentioning. In particular, I'm, I, I think in your short period of time, you pointed out a lot of factors about under, um, and some of them are out of our jurisdiction, but I'm just thinking about people having to go to work, um, not having time off, um, et cetera. So again, I don't know if you'll be sharing that with other committees, but uh, your thoughts about where we can make the biggest sort of difference right now would be really helpful to hear. Yeah, I'd be glad to do that. I, I think at this point, it's just really important for us not to embrace that natural desire to, to, to go to antistotal assertions uh, and 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 just jump, make a leap of logic that we're really just talking about uh, a class issue. We are talking about a class issue, but when you've got people dying at disproportionate rates, we're not just talking about a class issue anymore. Uh, we've known that systemic racism has and continues to adversely impact African Americans across all sectors, and we see them dying of COVID-19 at highly disproportionate rates. Okay, so yes, I am gonna come back with some specific recommendations. And the first one we've already done, we've asked the health commissioner pro to provide the data that we need so you can make informed decisions about what you're doing. Until then, I would just advise you to look across the nation because it's happening right around us. Again, I thank you for your time, Madam Chair. I thank you for the questions and I'll just uh, stop for here and look forward for the invite to come back. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Thank Great. you. Oh, sorry, Falco. All right. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. So uh, with my time today, um, I thought it'd probably be best. I'll, I was going to go through some of the principles we're using as the ACE. Oh, I will start off by actually introducing myself. So I'm Falco Schilling. I'm the advocacy director for the ACLU of Vermont. And for my testimony today, I was hoping to quickly go through the principles we've been using as we are trying to address this crisis some of the work that we've been doing, uh, what we've been hearing, um, what we've been concerned about and watching and um, changes that we think might be necessary. So I'm gonna try my best to get that in under 10 minutes. Um, and I, I appreciate you keeping the clock on me. So I keep moving. Uh, so in terms of our principles in addressing the crisis, um, the first one is that any measures taken should be grounded in science and proportional to the threat and no more, no more intrusive on civil liberties than absolutely necessary. And this is something that we believe we've seen throughout the response from the state of Vermont um, and is, is something that we are gonna continue to be watching as this moves forward. Uh, we believe public officials should be trusted messengers uh, of vital public health information and they should be presenting uh, accurate and timely information. This is once again, something we are, are very pleased to be seeing our state officials doing. Um, and these are, these are principles that the ACLU is applying across the nation as we watch um, different states uh, uh, try and address this uh, unprecedented crisis. And then finally, it's the responsibility of government to ensure that those who are most vulnerable, especially those under its care, are protected. Um, and so in light uh, of, especially looking at the third principle, um, much of our work over the last couple of weeks, though it seems like much longer than that, um, has been trying to focus on the Department of Corrections and the judiciary as a whole and looking at ways that we can try and reduce the number of people who are incarcerated by the state of Vermont um, at this time, understanding that the number of people who are incarcerated in these facilities makes it more likely that the virus could spread um, more widely, put people who are at risk at even greater health risk, and then also serve as vectors that not only infect people within the facilities, people who work in the facilities, and the larger communities that those people return to. So it was a way to try and help protect Vermont as a whole. So we've sent, um, sent a letter on March 11th to the Department of Corrections outlining preparedness steps and planning steps that we hope that they would adopt. Um, we sent a letter to the governor on March 18th um, that really focused on three primary asks. One was the prompt release of as many people in custody as possible to prevent infection and the spread of COVID-19. Uh, two is strict limits on any new prison admissions and adequate screening to determine the health status of people being incarcerated. And the third was evidence-based, humane, and rights-affirming measures to protect the health 
and safety of the individuals who remain incarcerated under the state's supervision. So um, through this, we've started a dialogue with the Department of Corrections. Um, and I will note that if you go to their website at this point in time, they do have a population tracker, which shows that uh, the current number of people incarcerated on a daily basis, as of yesterday, it was 1450. Uh, earlier in this session, that number was up above 1700. So there have been some pretty incredible steps taken um, to limit the number of people who are who are in the care of the Department of Correction in those facilities. Um, we do think that there's more that can be done and I'll try and address that quickly. Um, one of the major mechanisms that you have all heard about uh, through your testimony from the AG's office, uh, from the state's attorneys, as well as the Defender General's office is the efforts made within the court system to limit new admissions. We think that's had a significant impact. We also think the Department of Corrections policy to limit read, uh, readmissions or uh, furlough interrupts uh, from community supervision has also had a pretty significant impact since we know that accounts for 80% of the admission rates from the Senate's population. So that has been a large focus of our work, but that has not been all of it. Um, we have been trying to monitor what the legislature has been doing um, around changes to voting, public meetings. Um, we've been monitoring the very good work that's been, been done by our friends at, at Legal Aid around the rent moratorium. Um, but, and we've been hearing a lot from folks who have loved ones in facilities. So that in terms of what we're hearing from people we're working with is a lot of people who are concerned, um, especially about loved ones who are older and are incarcerated and what this might mean for them if the virus gets into these facilities. Um, and as we heard, just this morning, one of the facilities is on lockdown um, because of um, staff members testing positive who had had contact with inmates. So. Um, this work is, is immediate. There's a need to try and get as many people as possible into community-based settings um, as quickly as possible. Uh, but we have also seen a lot of cooperation and a lot of good work happening across the system and don't want to downplay um, the level of seriousness that is this work is being approached with uh, across the system. Um, we also have been just started hearing some concerns around uh, possible enforcement of the executive order, um, as was alluded to in the previous comment. We have not, as far as I know, I don't know if we have any direct concerns uh, raised about enforcement in the, the city of Burlington, though that is something that we are definitely watching very closely and our staff attorneys are, are concerned about. Um, as of now, we know that the approach being taken is an education first approach, and that is what we believe should be taken in these times, um, that anything that would lead to either to more interactions with the criminal justice system unnecessarily uh, is something we want to avoid at all costs um, as we're trying to help practice so effective social distancing, um, especially if those interactions are not necessary to pu protect public safety at that time. So. Um, we appreciate the um, education first approach and how that's uh, being addressed. Um, so I'm looking at my time. How am I doing? Five minutes. All right. Um, so we've been trying to reach out to partners across um, the, 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 the spectrum of issues to find out a number of concerns and trying to help lift up some of their good work. Um, I know that there have been some concerns raised um, around equal access to care if we're into triage situations. So that's another place that we have been um, monitoring. Um, concerns about voting is another one that we are um, watching as well. Um, but as I've said before, most of our work has been focused on trying to um, find ways to reduce the prison population um, in light of this virus and move people to community-based settings. Um, so in terms of changes we might uh, would, would think would be helpful within this emergency situation, um, one would be looking at the use of medical furlough. Uh, the Department of Corrections recently released a memo outlining their ability to use uh, medical furlough and noted that it is pretty limited under current statute to only those who have a, a, um, a chronic illness that has already been identified and leaves them physically incapable of presenting danger to the community. Um, this is something that we're gonna be calling on the governor and we hope the legislature will consider uh, an emergency order to allow for medical furlough for people who are at high risk of infecting the virus or at high risk of more complications. So people who would be at high risk, finding ways to allow those people to be medically furloughed 
um, which does not mean that they are, they, they would still be within the care of the Department of Corrections. They would still have the ability to do a risk assessment before those people are released. Um, but as the Department of Corrections notes, that's one of their limitations on their ability to um, get people who are high risk out of the facility. That's something that we think uh, would be appropriate um, in these times. And I also know that you will all will be looking at some of the emergency judicial orders um, and some of the language that I believe was presented to the Senate Judiciary. Um, we supported the language, uh, we do support the language as originally presented from um, Judge Grierson in terms of allowing for the stipulation for reduced sentences when there's agreements between the defense attorneys and the prosecuting attorneys and the judges. Um, the, the Defender General's office raised some concerns about limiting that, um, and they said they- About two minutes, Falco. All right, well, I'm just about to wrap up, so thank you very much. Um, we know the Defender General's office raised some concerns about tinkering with that language too much, um, but I believe they're also supportive of, of that language as introduced. So those are two changes that we think would be positive. Um, and, I, and I will also echo Mark's um, sentiments that better data collection as we go through this crisis is an essential uh, part of the response. So we understand how this is impacting Vermonters. Um, and that's something we're gonna be continuing to call on all the entities involved um, to provide more data, uh, especially as it relates to, to race. So um, I think that is about my time and I'll reserve the last minute or two for questions. Great, thank you so much. I am looking for hands. If I, I, I'm not seeing any and I'm, am I missing anybody? Selena. Um, I just wanted to make sure I, I um, might've missed a little bit of the last, um, so your three recommendations that I heard um, just at the end of your testimony were about clear policies for medical furlough and then expanding expanding eligibility for medical furlough at least through the duration of the crisis right and then um revisiting <laughs> for lack of, lack of a better word revisiting the sentencing second look yeah i think that is something that um i believe you're going to be hearing about later but we supported the language that was presented uh by judge gerson um, to the, the Senate Judiciary Committee. I know they've gone back and forth on that, but we are, we're supportive of that. Um, and then also just better data collection and reporting as we move through this crisis, especially as it re relates to racial disparities. So learning more about what's happening within our correction system. And then also a grave concern about as you know enforcement moves forward, if there is greater enforcement of the executive orders, how are they being enforced? Who is being, um, who is, who is um, be interacting with law enforcement, how are those uh, interactions going? So those are things that we want to see going forward. And um, you mentioned a couple of documents that I would love to read more closely if, if um, you're willing to share them with us. I didn't see uh, anything on the, our website today, but the guiding principles and yes. the open letters you wrote to yep. DOC if, and anything else you think is relevant, if you have written materials to um, share with us, I'd love to just have those on hand as a reference point. I'd be happy to share that um, with the committee. You can also, I mean, in terms of our, our principles and communication, that can be found at aclubt.org, uh, right on the front under our COVID um, response should be right at the top, um, but I will happily send along all those documents um, to your committee assistant after I'm off of this call, as well as the, the DOC policy memo about their priorities for release of sentence individuals. Great, thank you so much. Very helpful. Okay. And um, have you had an opportunity to speak with the corrections, the House Corrections Committee, Corrections Institution? I, I had an opportunity to speak with them last week, uh, specifically on the Justice Reinvestment Bill. So uh, spoke to you know S338 as it came over from the Senate. Uh, okay. So that is that's been the, the primary means of communication I've had with them so far, because I think okay. that's a major focus. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, great, all right, well, thank you very much, and we'll look forward to uh, speaking with you again. Great, take all care. All right, thank you very much, and thank you so yeah. much for the time. Yeah, you bet, uh, great, sure, okay. Uh, Eric. Yes, can you hear me? Welcome, yes. Okay. 
So um, I don't have anywhere near 10 minutes. I, I'm not sure exactly what the committee wants to hear. I have a few remarks and then I'm happy to answer questions. Great, and if you could state your um, name for the record, please. Absolutely. Thank uh, you. My name is Eric Avelton. I'm the Executive Director of Vermont Legal Aid. Legal Aid and our partner, Legal Services Vermont, like many others in Vermont, have been working hard to continue to play an important role in helping low-income and vulnerable Vermonters get the help they need with their critical legal problems. We have virtually all of our staff working from home and have cobbled together the technology necessary to operate our two hotlines from about 15 different locations, as well as supporting more than 80 staff members working from home. We've seen a dramatic 50% increase in calls to our general hotline in the last month. We average more than 80 calls a day, about 40% of which involve the caller's concern about their housing. At the same time that calls to our hotlines have been skyrocketing, the traffic on our website dedicated to providing legal information and links to court forms and other resources is off the charts. It's more than doubled in the past month and there were 10,000 different in-state users visiting the site in the last two weeks. Many of the calls to the hotline concern new and uncertain legal problems due to the pandemic. The most common calls involve precarious housing and family law situations, such as callers with pending court dates, those that think they have upcoming court dates, those trying to figure out whether if they need to go to leave home and go to court, anyone will be there. Other callers have had significant habitability or utility problems, but their landlords are unresponsive and they don't know what can be done. As with any stressful time, we are seeing an increase in family law disputes with parents trying to understand whether children need to be returned to the other parent or seeking our help to either prevent the child's transfer or to force the transfer to better protect a child's safety. A perhaps greater concern are the situations where a victim of domestic violence is forced to shelter at home with an abuser and is not able to get the necessary privacy to seek our help. As you might expect, there's been a sharp rise in calls about unemployment compensation with 44 calls in the last two weeks compared with just five calls during the same period last year. And we believe the, call, the volume of these calls will continue to grow substantially. We recognize that the demands on our, on our unemployment compensation system are extreme. However, we are concerned that the process of actually getting cash out to Vermonters is not going as smoothly as we hoped. Most of our clients desperately need those benefits and they need them now. How quickly those benefits will uh, get out will have a big impact on the court system. For without the unemployment compensation benefits, many people will not be able to pay their rent. And once the courts reopen for evictions, the courts are likely to be inundated with eviction filings. At the same time, how well programs for landlords and businesses work will also impact court filings, as landlords might be less disposed to file an eviction if they can quickly access loans and the other supports they've been promised. Other parts of legal aid also face significant challenges. The Office of Healthcare Advocate is fielding more than 50 calls a week, and our mental health law project continues to represent people in commitment cases. Finally, our long-term care ombudsmen are inundated with calls from terrified residents and family members of those in Vermont's nursing and residential care facilities. On Friday, one of my colleagues will be addressing your committee with, comment, with our comments on S-114, and she will address the changes we have seen in our housing practice and what we can expect in the future. I wanted to briefly address our family and domestic violence docket. As is true in the housing area, we believe it is essential that there is consistency statewide regarding access to the courts, personal safety, and public health. We have serious concerns with the court's continued scheduling of RFA orders, RFA hearings for in-court appearances in some counties. We believe that this puts our staff, court staff, and the litigants at significant risk during those hearings, many of which could be held by phone or delayed with an extended temporary order. Other states have simply extended all RFA orders statewide rather than schedule hearings. We have parents concerned about parent-child contact orders seeking our help to help them avoid exposure to the other household, as well as from foster parents concerned with visitation with the parents. We believe most existing orders could be extended, perhaps with court-ordered phone or video, quote, visitation. If a hearing is required, it should be carried out over the phone. We are not sure yet the full extent of the impact of the pandemic on the judiciary, but we believe the pressures on the courts and on low-income litigants will actually be worse when the stay-at-home order is lifted than it is now. We urge you to begin to plan for what will happen when the state of emergency ends and the courts begin hearing the, quote, non-emergency matters. 
While Vermont's legal assistance providers will be there to try and help solve these problems, we will not have the capacity to meet the coming surge of housing, family, unemployment, and health cases. Earlier this session, the state's Access to Justice Coalition proposed a set of initiatives aimed at renewing Vermont's commitment to access to justice for low-income litigants. Many of those initiatives could be readily adapted to focus on COVID-related legal problems as the pandemic winds down. Thank you for your hard work and I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Great, thank, thank you very much. Um, in terms of other states who um, are extending the um, relief from abuse orders or some of the um, family law um, orders, if you could, I don't know if you um, have that available, but if you could um, send that to us, that'd be very helpful. I will um, uh, talk with one of my colleagues uh, or a couple of them who have been particularly practicing in the domestic violence RFA area and I'll, I'll uh, get them to be in contact with you with some materials. Okay, great, thank you. I am looking for hands. Question. Martin. <clears throat> so um, to be able to extend uh, the temporary relief from abuse order, uh, I assume that we might need a legislative change during this period of time because right now uh, for an emergency order specifically they have to schedule a hearing within 14 days after the order has been issued. Do, do you agree that that's something that would be necessary or is there a way that courts are getting around that requirement right now? I believe the statutory change may be necessary but again I, I will also be sure to have the, the staff attorneys practicing in that area specifically get back to you with their, with recommended language uh, uh, and the confirmation that in fact it cannot be done, at least formally, we would need a statutory change, I believe. Uh, the courts have been um, being uh, flexible, shall we say, and uh, accomplishing some things with the letter of the law may not in fact uh, support. Right, which uh, understandable in this situation. And, and if there are other uh, suggestions that would ease that process uh, during this period of time, certainly that would be helpful to hear from your folks. I will get that. Am I anybody else? Nope. Okay, I'm not missing anybody. No. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I, I'm happy to, uh, you know, uh, reach out to other uh, staff members of Vermont Legal Aid. If particular areas come up, we have been working closely with the courts, the legislature, and the administration around a whole variety of different legal problems. And if mm -hmm. there's issues that your committee uh, uh, comes upon, I'm happy to respond. Thank you for everything you've been doing. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, um, so we're now going to move to Professor Carter. Welcome. Great, thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay, great. great. Would, you, would you like me to sort of just jump in or what, how, how would you like to yeah. proceed? I Absolutely. I, um, yeah. I know. Um, and uh, good morning, or I guess this afternoon, um, Eric. Then I, I know that Eric has, um, Fitzpatrick, our legislative counsel, has been in touch with you about the uh, yeah. some of the issues that we wanted to hear mm -hmm. about. So um, welcome you and we jump in yeah. and yeah. and um, sure we'll have questions. Great. Okay. No, I'm, I'm happy to be there. I appreciate it. Um, uh, on behalf of Vermont Law School, and I like to think of us as Vermont's law school as well as Vermont Law School. Uh, it's a real privilege to be able to be here and, and share my thoughts with you uh, at this obviously very difficult um, time. And I would just like to enter into the official legislative record that uh, two uh, intrepid Vermont Law School students, Anders Newbery and uh, Adam Mittermeier assisted with, with uh, some really terrific research on this important topic. Um, and I begin just by recognizing from a constitutional perspective that uh, the legislative branch is obviously a co-equal branch. And I think even in these difficult times and these times of crisis, it's certainly heartening to me as a Vermont resident and as a constitutional law professor uh, that the Judiciary Committee is, is taking a look at these difficult issues because as a co-equal branch uh, in a constitutional order, the legislature does have uh, important oversight roles to play. 
Um, and one of the wonderful things about the Constitution, in my mind, is that it really is a nonpartisan document or should be a nonpartisan document. Uh, and and um, I'll do my best to keep my opening remarks to 10 to 12 minutes, as, as Eric asked. Um, but it's always hard for a law professor to stop. And when we're talking about something like the Constitution, it's even harder. So I, I apologize if I get going. Feel free to, to jump in. Um, I'll focus my opening comments on a couple of areas here this morning, consistent with what Eric and I had, had talked about. Number one, I want to talk a little bit about the constitutional implications of Governor Scott's uh, executive order. And I'll primarily focus on uh, addendum seven in paragraph five that deals with the travel issues, um, as that, that seemed to be of interest to the committee. But certainly, I'm happy to try to answer questions related to other components of it as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll talk a bit about the statutory uh, authorities, and then perhaps um, some things that the legislature could look at if it so desired. Uh, I do this all from a position of humility uh, in, in these trying times. I don't think there are concrete, uh, perhaps unfortunately, answers to these constitutional questions. We've certainly never faced anything like this um, in, in our generation and probably in the history of the country uh, when it comes to um, a, a pandemic. So I, I don't represent that I have the answers. I'll do my best to give you my thoughts based on the case law, the statutes, and the constitutional provisions at play. So first of all, constitutional implications. At first blush, it's important to recognize that the executive uh, of each state does have broad authority in times of public health emergency. And traditionally, the US Supreme Court and the circuit courts have said that that is the purview of the states under our federalist system of government. Um, now that can cut both ways, of course. On the one hand, uh, allowing states to try different approaches um, allows us to learn from each other, what worked, what didn't in New York, how can we apply that in Vermont? On the other hand, a virus doesn't know boundaries. Um, and so a patchwork can also be a drawback. But nonetheless, the authority uh, that the Supreme Court has seen in the context of a public health emergency um, is broad with the state executives. So what are the constitutional implications of Governor Scott's um, uh, order? And again, focusing primarily on, on the travel components here. Uh, I think there's really three areas of constitutional law that would be the most relevant um, and at least raise questions that I think an oversight committee such as yourselves uh, might be interested in taking a look at. Uh, the first is this issue of the Commerce Clause. Um, now, as a general principle, it's the federal government who has the authority under the Constitution to regulate interstate commerce, commerce and travel between the states. Admittedly, we're not in a normal situation. Um, so to a certain extent, I think take all of these with that grain of salt, all of these comments with that grain of salt. But traditionally, it's the federal government that regulates interstate commerce. That means, and the US Supreme Court has said this, that when states unduly burden interstate commerce and interstate travel, that those laws may be held invalid. The Supreme Court has tended to focus that on instances where the state seems to be exercising some sort of economic protectionism for its own uh, residents uh, rather than a more general application. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, interstate commerce is generally the purview of the federal government. That doesn't mean the states cannot regulate it. Um, and certainly in an emergency situation, those abilities are perhaps heightened, particularly when the federal government is not acting in, an, in a universally applicable manner. Uh, but the legal test that courts would look at, first of all, is does the law burden interstate commerce? Uh, and I think uh, in this instance, the answer is certainly paragraph five of the of the addendum seven to the executive order does have a burden on interstate travel, interstate commerce. That doesn't, again, necessarily mean that it's constitutionally infirm, but states are likely to face higher scrutiny in general terms when uh, there is a distinction made between residents and non-residents, as is the case here. A state's gonna have to probably meet a higher, stricter standard of scrutiny. Um, and courts will look at whether the benefits outweigh the burdens and whether there is an adequate alternative that's less burdensome uh, to interstate commerce. 
Uh, here, I don't think there's any evidence of economic favoritism, obviously. Um, and in terms of adequate alternatives, at least based on my knowledge, uh, I think um, there's no widespread mechanism of identifying who is a carrier of COVID-19 and who is not. Um, and so it, it, it doesn't seem uh, to be an adequate alternative to say, have testing of everybody at the border or some process like that. Those tests just don't exist. So there probably is no adequate alternative uh, in light of the realities that we're operating within. So I don't think that um, Governor Scott's order under the Commerce Clause or the Dormant Commerce Clause is likely unconstitutional. I think it would stand up to constitutional scrutiny if there was constitutional scrutiny. Second area that I'd highlight just briefly is the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the federal constitution. That's article four, section two for all those that are following along in their constitutional pocket handbooks. Um, it, it essentially says citizens of each state are entitled to all the privileges and immunities of citizens of the several states. And the underlying principle behind that at the founding of the adoption was we don't want states discriminating against residents of other states or they'll turn on each other. Uh, and so, some classic examples are things like your driver's license from Vermont works in Florida or works in California. Marriage certificate in Vermont is, in, is valid in Colorado. Uh, judicial orders are valid across state lines. That's based on this principle of uh, privileges and immunities. So how does that fit here uh, with Governor Scott's order and the, um, the language around visitors being uh, instructed not to travel to Vermont from particular hotspots. I think always important, what's the constitutional test at play? First, first factor that a court would look at is, is a non-resident discriminated against in their ability to conduct fundamental activities? That's number one. And by fundamental activities, we're really talking about constitutionally protected interests. Is a non-resident discriminated against? Uh, number two, the courts would look at does the state have a substantial reason to discriminate based on residency? And then number three, are there no less discriminatory uh, alternatives? Um, and the idea is, as the courts have held since the 1800s, it's to protect the free ingress of uh, citizens of one state into, citizens, into, into other states, that fundamental right to interstate travel. Uh, that is enshrined in the Constitution under US, US Supreme Court jurisprudence. Um, again, I think looking, walking through each of those factors here, Governor Scott's order clearly does, I think on its face, distinguish between residents and non-residents. If you look at uh, paragraph five of, of addendum seven, it does say visitors are instructed not to travel to Vermont. Um, a visitor presumably is a non-resident. And it applies to folks that are coming from uh, these hot spots as well, New York, Connecticut, Louisiana, et cetera. Um, so I think it only applies to non-residents. Um, and the order does appear to implicate uh, protected interests, right? Fundamental activities, namely that right to interstate travel and the ability of, uh, of free ingress into Vermont if you are a visitor and coming from one of those hot spots or are coming from one of those hot spots rather. Um, moving through that analysis, remember we look at does the state have a substantial reason? And I think here battling obviously a, a pandemic, uh, the likes of which we've never seen, um, COVID-19 uh, is a substantial reason uh, for the state's actions. But, and this is where I think um, uh, it's perhaps a bit more constitutional murky bit more murky in terms of the constitution. Um, but I think uh, what courts generally require is some justification for the, the, the distinction between residents and non-residents. Um, some support that the non-residents, the visitors in this case, are a particular source of the problem. Uh, and I think a closer examination of the, of the, the order uh, at least calls that into question. Uh, in other words, um, uh, if, a, if it's the, a visitor coming from a hot spot is likely to be a health risk in the same way that a Vermont resident coming from that hot spot would be a health risk. Um, and so I think 
if you think of an example, right, a, um, a Vermont resident coming back from New York City, they would be able to enjoy that right of interstate travel, whereas a New York City resident uh, coming up to Vermont uh, with the same potential health risk, they've both been in a hot spot, would not be able to enjoy that constitutional right. And that's, I think, what tends to concern courts to the extent there's anything in here that concerns them. And then that question, are there potentially less burdensome approaches? Again, I don't have the answers to that question, uh, but I do think um, a different word other than visitors um, might achieve the state's interests while not discriminating based on one's residency, which is critical to privileges and immunities analysis. Um, so I think that's perhaps something to look at. The final constitutional uh, issue that I'd cover um, is due process. And the idea of due process is that, um, you know, as, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, when you have a fundamental right at stake, that the government needs to have some sort of process in place, procedural due process, uh, to make sure that that right isn't being uh, burdened in a, in, a, in a manner that lacks process, lacks protections. Um, and, and the legal test there um, in the context of, of this, I think is, is likely to be um, that a restriction on the right to travel must be necessary to a compelling state interest. Again, I think the state has a compelling state interest, obviously. Um, and so the question becomes, is it necessary? And I don't have an answer to that. Um, nobody has an answer to that until a court decides. Uh, what the answer to that is. But certainly, I think from a, a purely um, liability issue, one could argue um, that it isn't necessary to uh, discriminate against visitors versus residents. Um, in other words, if a 14-day self-isolation is enough for a Vermonter, why isn't that enough for a visitor? Why do we have to have that added layer of, if you're a visitor, you can't come at all. In other words, that piece, I think, arguably, um, or an argument could be made that that isn't, isn't a necessary um, component of, of, of furthering the state's obviously compelling interest. Um, we don't have data on that. You know, we don't, I don't think, I haven't seen data on whether visitors are more, like a more, more likely to be a health risk or how these particular provisions of the order are being enforced. But I certainly think that's something that, um, from a constitutional oversight perspective, that even in a crisis, the legislature could look at um, uh, that data. Because ultimately, with many of these things, in determining whether something is necessary or not, that's a, that's a, a, a common test in a constitutional context, uh, courts are going to look at, well, is it necessary to further that compelling government interest? And what we're really looking at there is, what does the data show? Um, and, and so understanding how these particular provisions are being enforced and what the data of enforcement indicates could go a long way to making um, these actions constitutionally uh, uh, valid. Um, again, I'm not saying at this point that they are not, but if the legislature is looking for ways to engage in that oversight role, certainly enforcement data would be one place that um, that that you could look. I think the last thing I would just touch on, and again, this gets to the constitutional delegation of authority issues that are so critical in both peacetime and crisis, is what is the statutory authority for these sorts of orders, whether it's Vermont or anywhere else in the country. And in Vermont, uh, the governor is cited to the emergency uh, acts, the emergency management acts, 20 VSA, and I think sections 8, 9, and 11. Um, and there are broad catch-all provisions in those statutes uh, that seem to grant the executive broad authority in the context of, an, of, an, uh, of a declared emergency. For example, 20 VSA section 11 paragraph six says that the governor has authority, quote, to perform and exercise such powers as may be deemed necessary to promote and secure the safety and protection of the civilian population. That's a very broad grant of authority on the other hand, it doesn't explicitly say um, that uh, any administration can uh, put up barriers to travel uh, or, or you know, 
categorize visitors versus non-visitors, residents versus non-residents. So I think certainly the legislature in its role, constitutional role, performing oversight could look at um, what the delegated authority is and decide, um, have we given the governor too little authority? Does he have too much authority? Is it just right? Those are certainly roles that I could see the legislative branch looking at in addition to that enforcement data and enforcement oversight. Um, I think in the end, just having these sorts of hearings is very, very important. Uh, and I don't say that just as a, a citizen and a resident of Vermont, but from a constitutional perspective, as a co-equal branch of government, uh, in the end, government of course needs to be able to rise to the challenges that it faces and respond to a crisis, no question about it. But as a constitutional lawyer, uh, I don't think we can lose sight of the fundamental underpinnings of our constitutional order. And that is ultimately a constitutional oversight role as a co-equal branch of government, even in a crisis. Uh, and so just the fact that this committee is taking testimony on these sorts of issues, I think sends a message that Vermonters are paying attention and that when we get through this horrible crisis, it will be important that we go back to the fundamental constitutional order and constitutional rights that have made Vermont and I think the United States a special place. Um, and I think these checks and balances are very important, both in a crisis, which we obviously face, uh, and in peacetime. And so I appreciate you, you taking the time to hear this testimony. Um, I'm more than happy to do my best, as I said, to answer any questions that uh, any members of the committee have. Um, but okay. that's that's essentially the end of my commentary. Great. Well, well, thank you very much. And we did give you um, extra time because I knew that the committee would have a number of questions. I do, before I take questions, um, could you just please state your, your name um, for the record? Sure, Jared uh, Carter. Great, great, from Vermont Law School. Okay, great. Vermont Law School, yeah. Uh, questions, comments? See, Martin, who else? Okay, let's start with Martin and then I'll, let's see. Um, so looking at the, uh, executive order mm -hmm. uh the paragraph five that you mentioned yeah, yeah. Uh, with respect to um travel mm -hmm. uh the the fact that it states in this uh in that paragraph that residents of new york new jersey and connecticut should stay in their home states in strict compliance with cdc travel guidance issued saturday march 28th 2020 does mm -hmm. that citation or uh to the to that federal guidelines somehow help with respect to for instance the commerce clause issue i mean if the cdc guidance is saying new yorkers stay home uh are we violating anything by yeah stay home don't travel to vermont yeah i think that's a good question um and and certainly when you're talking about the commerce clause to the extent that the federal government has acted that does provide, I think, some cover for states to act consistent with that. Uh, and so, um, if this is if that's part of the basis for the governor's order here, and they cite to that, and and it's consistent with those things, then I, then I would certainly would certainly posit that yes, um, uh, from a purely commerce cause perspective, that does seem to um, reinforce the authority of the state to do this. I haven't looked at the guidance of the CDC, so I don't really know what exactly it says, but just assuming that that's what yeah. it said. But uh. Yeah, and I think the other thing, uh, you know, the CDC travel guidance is guidance. Um, it's not something that's, you know, being actively enforced by law enforcement, so far as I know. Um, but I do think that that does, from a Commerce Clause perspective, at least send the message that um, we're not running afoul of what the federal government is doing. Um, and I think that calls in, into question, uh, or not calls into question, but um, raises issues around preemption. So federal law can preempt state law, uh, as we know. Um, and so to the extent that we're acting consistent with federal guidance, um, reinforces the idea that we, it, we aren't preempted from doing what we're doing. Thanks. Tom. Thank you, Maxine. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Carter. Uh, I found it real interesting. But um, but uh, one of the things uh, uh, that 
the way I understood it with, with, uh, with the constitutional issues that uh, we could be in is, did I hear you right being in unprecedented, unprecedented times that uh, new rulings may, may have to be made on some of these issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think what I'm, I'm getting at is that, um, well, first of all, in, in instances of public health emergencies, the courts have consistently deferred to um, the authorities, the executives, unless a, unless a, a, a law, rule, egg regulation is uh, arbitrary, oppressive, unreasonable, then they aren't going to meddle. Uh, and I think that's particularly heightened when you're faith facing a like health emergency. Um, I think the point I'm trying to make is that yes, um, courts do tend to, uh, they operate in our society. Um, they are products of our society. And so certainly um, things can change depending on the necessity of uh, of a particular regulation. So, in a, in, and that's why you see instances where in emergencies, authority is broader. Courts are much more likely to defer to the executive branch. Um, and we haven't had a pandemic, an epidemic uh, uh, of this nature ever, and certainly not since 1918 with the Spanish flu. And so we, we don't have much case law. There's a smattering of cases uh, where the courts have looked at this and they have tended to favor executive authority. There's a case from 1902 at the US Supreme Court where a ship uh, with folks from Europe was denied by the, the Port of New Orleans the ability to disembark. And the US Supreme Court said under the Commerce Clause and due process principles, uh, that was okay for the state to prohibit uh, those folks from disembarking. Where courts have been much more likely to uh, uh, be more circumspect are instances where there is discrimination based on race or if it's forced isolation. In other words, someone is being forcibly isolated uh, uh, and that is being enforced. Now, whereas here we have self-isolation and it isn't clear that there's any specific enforcement mechanism. Okay, and, and uh, one other thing, uh, what I think I, it may not be your exact words, but what I think I heard you say is you talked about when we come out of this, Mm. And um, did you say that maybe some of some of these things should be looked at? Well, I, I think the point I'm trying to make is that when this is over, you know, when we get past this, however long that takes, hopefully not very, uh, but when this is over, it will be very important for us to remember what the, 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 the base layer, what the constitutional norms are, because it's not normal uh, for folks to be uh, self I, required to self isolate. It's not normal to say people from New York can't come into Vermont. And I just think certainly the role of of uh, of um, the legislature and the administration and Vermonters to remember that, so that when this is over, we haven't ceded fundamental rights. Uh, that's always the concern in an emergency. Uh, and I think that's the point I was trying to make. Okay, no, that's great. That's great. And, and I know at this point, there's a lot of people who already think those rights are being violated. And, and one thing that I've talked about with people is uh, um, government, the authorities holding on too long. And, mm -hmm. and that's all going to be relative. I mean, as I said, there's some people that already think that. And, um, and and where's the tipping point, I guess, as far as the population goes. But again, I, I want to say thank you. I really appreciate your testimony today. It's some yeah, of the most compelling I've, I've heard, uh, uh, for me anyway, uh, in the 10 years that I've uh, been in the legislature. So thank you. Well, thank you. I, I wish just wish my students would say something like that to me. <laughs> um, Selena, I see your hand. Uh, yes. I'm going to lower my hands now. Okay, so I'm wondering if you, uh, thank you. I want to echo what others have said. This has been really um, helpful and I particularly ap appreciate um, how you're under, you underscoring like, okay, wh what do we need to do to um, ensure that our fundamental rights are, you know, kind of we're reset to constitutional norms. I'm wondering if you want to um, comment at all on some of the civil ticketing that's been announced in Burlington 
Um, yeah, just at all, if you want to comment on that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, my, my hope, uh, and I, I'm not entirely familiar, again, I think the data has got to drive the, uh, the, the decisions, but certainly my hope is that um, we're not rushing to ticketing um, and that the, 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 the data doesn't bear out. And this is where I think enforcement oversight is really, really important. Who are the people that are getting tickets? Um, certainly if you're a, 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 a homeless person or a, a person that doesn't have a place to go, uh, and those are the folks that are getting the tickets, I think there's, it, that would be incredibly troubling from a constitutional perspective. Uh, but until we know, until we see that data, it's, 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 it's speculative. And again, I think that's certainly from a, a constitutional co-equal branches of government, whether it's at the city level and city council, taking an oversight role in, in determining who is this being enforced against, um, or it's the state legislature taking that oversight role. It's just so, so, so critical. Because certainly uh, if, we're, if we're enforcing this against people based on their economic status, their status as, as um, uh, somebody who doesn't have a place to shelter, uh, race, gender, sexual orientation, any of those protected classes would be hugely problematic. And so until we know what's happening, it's impossible, I think, to make informed decisions. So really, really important to get to the bottom of that sort of data. And I think that can happen even when we're in a crisis and should happen, because that's how in the end, I think we get back to the constitutional norms that we've got to get back to once this crisis is over. Coach. Uh, professor, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, like Tom, I found that, you know, riveting. Uh, it's interesting your point about data, uh, and you did uh, state that uh, a number of different times during your uh, presentation. And I think that supports, um, uh, well, our other two speakers as well, both the ACLU uh, and uh, Mark Hughes, um, I just got a, a a post, a message post from a family member who is a sergeant uh, on the East Hartford Police Department, uh, giving an example of a stop that was made by one of the officers uh, because of a black customer at Walmart. Uh, wearing a mask mm -hmm. and they felt that uh, uh, he was uh, uh, going to, you know, exhibit some odd behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we have this whole thing of uh, shopping while black. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, until we hear more instances of that, uh, like you said, with the data, um, it's it's fascinating because that goes to the point of the systemic uh, environment that we're living in. But your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I read a similar similar article. Uh, I think actually this morning, and I don't know that it was from from Hartford. Um, but with any grant of broad authority, uh, and certainly the courts, and I, I would say under the Emergency Powers Act that the legislature passed years ago. Uh, the governor does have broad authority. With any grant of, of broad authority, there needs to be a commensurate opportunity to uh, do that fundamental oversight. Um, and that is, again, this idea of a co-equal branch of government. Yes, it is easy for the executive, whether it's a mayor or a governor, um, to act you know, more efficiently uh, than, say, a legislature. And I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm probably saying the wrong thing to the wrong group of folks, but obviously moving through the legislative process, if every single decision that had to be made in an emergency had to pass both houses of the legislature, uh, uh, et cetera, it would be very difficult to do. And so we do need a vibrant executive. On the other hand, because of exactly the things that, uh, that you've highlighted, uh, it's very important to have that data, to have that oversight, that is the check. And that's what protect, protects us in the long run from these things, um, uh, these broad grants of authorities to becoming uh, uh, systemic uh, and 
the horrible implications for our society when when these sorts of decisions are being made at the local level based on race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, all of these protected classes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, you did touch on this, but I um, also wanted if you if you could please speak a little bit more about traffic stops and uh, what authority uh, law enforcement does have to to stop a car. I've heard from a number of um, constituents concerned about uh, students coming home from college and being stopped uh, both uh, inside and outside of Vermont. Yeah. I think a fair question. I, I'm not sure. The last, the, the, the latest I've heard, I think from uh, it was Commissioner Sherling, although it might have been somebody else, that what they're doing at the borders at this point is essentially collecting data, watching to see who's coming in and, and who's going out. I haven't heard uh, specifically of, of individuals being pulled over based on, you know, say their license plate. Um, and again, I think that's why this 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 oversight, this data, will be very very important uh, to get from uh, the, the the administration. Even in this crisis, it seems as though um, it's it's certainly constitutionally relevant to get to that question of is this particular activity necessary? Is this particularly particular rule necessary? Well, we can't decide that unless we see what the data shows. If the data shows that visitors have a higher likelihood of um, being carriers of, of COVID-19, then perhaps the, the, the enforcement of, of it is, is necessary. If, it, if they don't, then there's a question. Um, so I think that data is very, very important. Um, uh, and I think in terms of the delegated authority under the, under the statutes, how far does the legislature how far does the legislature want that to extend? Um, I think that that language that I read a few moments ago about uh, activities necessary, powers necessary to protect the, the, the civilian population, um, what does that mean? Um, and certainly the legislature would have a role in, in determining that. Does it mean you can pull someone over uh, because they have a New Jersey license plate when they're coming home from college or or you know any of these circumstances that your constituents are talking about, um, I think certainly that is a, that is a, a debate that could that the legislative branch could have. Thank you. Any anybody else, including Eric? I don't know, Eric, if you have any questions or comments. No, I'm all set. Thanks, Maxine. Sure, you bet. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, but I want to make sure I haven't missed anybody. No, okay, great. Thank you so much. It's really been interesting and helpful and really, really appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to be here. I wish you all the best of luck. Uh, be safe and, and stay well. Great, thank you. Great. Thank you, Professor. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. So committee, we are ahead of the schedule. Let me just look. Um, okay. So before I open up to general discussion, anybody have anything they want to ask or start with or no? So yeah, um, the issues that we just talked about with the professor, uh, mm -hmm. as far as next steps, it seems one of the, the one of the overriding issues is understanding the the necessity for the particular action of of banning or discouraging the travel, uh, and whether there's a a less uh, discriminatory or intrusive method. But it seems to me that the at least the question of the necessity is beyond the this committee's expertise. I mean, that would seem to be a something that human services or the health committee would have to weigh in on that this is necessary and there aren't any other better ways to do this. And then we apply 
uh, the constitutional analysis from the judiciary's perspective on whether we agree or how big of a threat this is, et cetera, as far as uh, being struck down because it's unconstitutional. So I, I mean, I don't know if if this is something that the other committees are taking up. I, and, and I don't I guess I'd ask Eric if this is and you, Maxine, if if my understanding of that is correct or not. I haven't I haven't heard that these are concerns of other committees. Uh, but Eric can can uh, can chime in if, if, if he knows. Um, certainly the uh, in enforcement, like some of the questions we heard earlier about um, Burlington and some of those measures, um, I've heard those concerns and uh, we'll have David share at one point, um, talk to us about, about their guidance, guidance and uh, how they got there. Um, Eric, do you, have you heard of any other committees being concerned? No, nothing, uh, nothing beyond what uh, uh, you folks have sort of done to solicit some input from a, a law school professor. But um, mm -hmm. I think sort of general thoughts about, um, you know, making sure that the actions are consistent with constitutional values. I think committees have expressed that general perspective that, that the committee had as well. Mm -hmm. I know that um, Senate Judiciary, I think, is going to be talking Awesome. We lost you, Eric. Yeah. Huh. Uh, personnel taking notes about which people are, which, which the license plates of cars that are crossing the border, that sort of thing. Actually, so, excuse me, Eric. So we lost you um, when you said Senate Judiciary is, and then we, we lost you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've had a poor connection today. Uh, mm -hmm. The... Uh, um, issue that they're looking into a little bit, and I say looking into, they're, they're just hearing some testimony from the Agency of Transportation about is the, um, there's been some suggestion that there have been some uh, recording of which license plates from which states have been crossing the border into Vermont in different places. <clears throat> so that issue is one that's sort of connected to what's been talked about today. And I think they're going to talk a little bit about that on Thursday. That's the only specific thing I've heard about, other than the sort of general concern that that the committee uh, registered today. Tom, I see your hand is up. Thank you, Maxine. <clears throat> Martin, yeah, this was uh, uh, pretty much came along because I, I had asked for it. Um, just some concerns that I had uh, with uh, uh, just people talking, you know, the, the, the chatter that you hear, you know, in the times we're in. And, and, and I thought that was a great idea you had that it may have to go to human services or health, uh, the health committee first, be, if this was pursued before it came to us. And, and uh, from what Eric's saying, uh, other committees are touching on it a little bit. And, and uh, just for myself, I certainly hope that it is, uh, it is looked at in hindsight. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, right now, I, I, I don't think it would be uh, proper to uh, step in on anything um, uh, just because we're in such unprecedented territory right now. I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's what's what's right and what's wrong at this point, you know, as far as what's happening. And, and I think uh, a lot of that is going to get uh, sifted out uh, for the future because of this. So um, again, I, I do hope we can, uh, um, look at this uh, in, in hindsight uh, and hopefully uh, uh, improve the system, I guess, uh, going forward. But So, I, I mean, I just, just a comment on that is, um, I mean, I could see that a scenario where uh, this continues longer than we hope <laughs> that, that they're locked down and, uh, and the, the whole situation continues longer and uh, there's a next progression uh, for law enforcement where they, in fact, are starting to stop people at the border. Maybe that's the time we take it up a little bit more because if that happens, I could also see uh, a lawsuit against that component of the executive order. And, uh, and the professor is right that we could, if we, the legislature looks into it and says, yeah, this is why this is necessary because that 
is a little weak as far as what is in that executive order. It's somewhat justified, but if the legislature as a co-equal branch has examined it and said, this is a necessary step, there's not a better way to do this, that would make it a stronger uh, action as far as if it does get challenged in court. And, and maybe it's something we just kind of monitor if it looks like this is gonna be lasting for a while longer, then maybe we should urge the other committees with that expertise on the health impact issue uh, to take this up. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, it's especially you touching on to if there's any escalation as far as uh, uh, um, law enforcement goes and that type of thing. So. Maxine. Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, well, one of the interesting things, uh, and I noticed this uh, because the the way to uh, the uh, pharmacy, uh, you know, because we have that big clover leaf here in uh, uh, White River uh, to go over to New Hampshire, which opens up a whole nother uh, ball game uh, in this discussion about inter uh, versus intra-state uh, jurisdictions. We don't have a hospital uh, here in the White River area. We have one of the biggest in New England, 2.5 miles away from my home. So the Vermonters on the border in the Upper Valley have to go or, or you would think would have to go to uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock, but we haven't really gotten, uh, let's say guidance or information about how that's really gonna work <laughs> uh, because one state says one thing and the other state says the other thing. And even though your, your doctors might be over there, it, it, I mean, uh, it, th there's been some relaxing of the rules as far as uh, uh, the whole medical uh, discussion between the two states, uh, but that travel piece, and then the uh, this recording of the data, there have been state trucks parked at the U-turn between the, the two states. Uh, and I mean, uh, uh, one of my constituents sent me a picture at 6.09 was the time timestamp. So uh, to get to Martin and to uh, Tom's uh, uh, discussion, the, 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 they're counting or doing something. Um, but when you see three state trucks and a supervisor vehicle in the picture, you ask yourself, well, they're not doing maintenance at six o'clock at night, you know. So uh, it 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 raises some questions about what what are we doing and how we're doing it. But and those were um, DMV and and VTrans trucks, is that correct? Uh, they were they were uh, VTrans. Okay, all right. So we certainly, if if folks are interested, we certainly can ask. Uh, be trans to come in and uh, as well as DPS and ask them what type of data they're collecting uh, that we are seeing trucks and <laughs> see thumbs up. Um, so that's uh, making a list. So that's certainly something that that we can do. Um, I, I've heard concerns about sheriffs. Um, so we can certainly bring folks in. Okay. Um, and, and just a, a, a quick uh, geeky thing, you know, you notice things sometimes. And so going, going back, you know, like in, you know, like into the center of town on, on uh, Saturday, I had to, you know, go over to, you know, the pharmacy again. And uh, so on my way back, there were, a disproportionate number of out-of-state plates versus the Vermont plates that I saw. And it wasn't like I was doing a statistical analysis. 
It was just an observation. I saw more uh, of one particular state than, and, and that's not the Vermont, New Hampshire thing on the, on the valley. This, these were from one of our neighbor states and you just went, why are there so many? <laughs> and, and there's no events going on. So, I mean, you know, other than possible uh, uh, second homeowners, you know, that might be the other, you know, the other piece. Thank Ken, you. Do you, Ken, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, just, uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, I think if we back this up a lot, even before or during the governor, when he first came out, I believe Senator Leahy was telling, asking people very nicely to, to stay out of Vermont and limit your travel. I think, uh, and I'm having serious computer problems today, by the way. But um, I think the other thing um, that we really need to keep in mind is I'm sure there's some sort of policing that, that's going on out there uh, with stuff there has to be, but I don't, I have not heard of anything that we're overdoing anything or anything like that. If anything, what I've heard more is we've got more speeders out there on the highways and, and more stuff like that. But I mean, let's face it, we know this is prime time for uh, the, the drug runners and some of this other stuff that we deal with all the time. And I sure, um, everybody wants data, they want this and they want that. And we hear every day that data is lacking or data is changing changing from day to day, whether you're listening uh, to Como or you're listening to the president or you're, you're even listening to our governor. So I'm not really, uh, I'm not really sure what we're going to uh, get to at this point because it's all so new and it's so overwhelming. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm getting bombarded primarily with uh, people looking for, uh, for money and how to do other different things. Tom, do you have, I see your hand up. Yeah, just real quick, uh, you had mentioned the sheriffs or somebody coming in possibly. And, and, and I guess what I'd like to hear from them is uh, if anybody at all is getting pulled over. I mean, you hear the rumors, uh, um, you know, if, if, one, if it's one person, if it's 20 people or if it's none, I, I would just like to know definitively if they have pulled over like somebody from out of state or, uh, uh, in that type of thing for uh, being pulled over for uh, non uh, COVID-19 reasons, but that being used as the excuse, you know, just, uh, uh, I'm going to say, I, I really doubt it, but um, it would just be good to hear it put, then those rumors can be put to rest. Great. Thank you. So anything else on law enforcement and uh, this before I move on to some other topics. Uh, Selena. Yeah, I just would like to, oh, oh, phew, sorry. Now I apologize for being unmuted though, because I have background noise. Um, I would just like to understand if there are other jurisdictions that are, um, have explicitly created, you know, civil infractions if it's just Burlington or if there's other municipalities who are going a similar route. Great, okay. Anybody else on this? Um, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, it might be uh, uh, interesting for all of us to take a look. Um, it just came out a couple of minutes ago. Uh, uh, the governor, has requested a federal disaster uh, order, uh, and I just scanned it. But you know, there's some implications there too around some of the questions that we've already uh, asked. So it'd be interesting to uh, take at least a few minutes at some point and take a look at at the implications with that, because a lot of it. Uh, uh, overlaps with some of the discussions we've just had.
Thank you. Okay. I have um, a few notes that I wanted to address. Um, first thing is um, Friday we're scheduled in the afternoon and that's Good Friday. And I just wanted to um, see if that was, I'm sorry that I didn't pick up on that before. And if that's an issue for anybody because we certainly can, can cancel. So, okay, I'm, I'm hearing that people are okay being, being present. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so some of the, in terms of our earlier witnesses, some of the things that were mentioned, uh, the, um, the medical furlough, um, I'm hoping I'll check in with, um, with uh, Chairwoman Emmons. I'm hoping that, that corrections, that's really something within their jurisdiction. I'm hoping that they will hear about that. Uh, but certainly that is, is something of, um, of interest. And let's see, um, the other thing is, um, Justice Reinvestment 2, uh, my understanding, I think we heard from Mark, is that Corrections has started to take some testimony and they've taken some testimony on the uh, racial disparities piece, which is certainly something within our jurisdiction. Uh, so I'll also check in and see what, what that committee's plans are with that. Um, that's certainly a very important um, piece of legislation that, that I was, uh, my dog saying hi. <laughs> um, that uh, I was concerned might, that we might lose um, with all of this. So I'm glad to see that there is testimony being, um, being taken and, uh, and I know that's of interest to, to folks. Um, let's see what else. Other things that, um, from we heard today or other things that you're hearing from constituents within our jurisdiction that folks wanna take testimony on next week? Maxine? Barbara. Hi. Um, so two things. One is the medical furlough. It's great if institutions take that up. I remember Marshall the other day saying that he was worried that um, they've been able to find some ways to do some things creatively. And it, it just seems like it might be good for us to sort of keep an eye on if institutions makes changes, if it's something that will interfere with what the um, public defenders and the state attorneys have been able to do. Um, so that was one thing. And then, gosh, let me see what the other one was. Okay, oh, I wrote a note so I wouldn't forget. As we are starting to look at appropriations for next year, and as Mark mentioned, money coming to the state, um, and also coach talking about federal um, disaster money. It would be great if a probes is looking to hear from our committee about what our priorities are or things that we would love them to not forget about taking into consideration. Thank you, uh, Selena. I think it's on our agenda for Friday to, that we're gonna hear from the network again, but I think really looking at the question of how we get clear and consistent practice around RFA across the state um, is really critical. And yeah, so that, that would be, for sure a high priority and I actually think some of the work that we did you know about really troubleshooting that process um, in 610 that has nothing to do with firearm relinquishment could be a good basis for digging into that but um because we did a lot we took a lot of testimony about just that process and the challenges of the remote process and how to Try to make it work better and more consistently, um, but that that seems like a really critical need. So I hope we'll prioritize. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm looking for hands. Um, okay, uh, Tom and then Barbara. Thank you. Um, going back to uh, to Mark Hughes. Um, 
he it sounds like he's going to get a couple hours uh, along with other witnesses uh, with Senate Judiciary. And it, uh, it sounds like he uh, uh, he may get uh, uh, more time with us also going forward, this remembering what was said and, and head shakes and that type of thing. <laughs> um, so would it work? Instead of him uh, going to Senate Judiciary for two hours and then coming with, with everybody and, and testifying with us for two hours, could we uh, put together a joint meeting? And, and possibly, uh, I know uh, Corrections has brought up, been brought up, if, uh, if that would be uh, uh, the right way to go at that point too. It would, uh, would Again, just getting everything done at once and, and then uh, all the witnesses don't have to spread their time so thin and uh, just to say the same thing. So, Right. Now, that's that's a great idea. And I will. So there's a chairs meeting today, so I can certainly reach out to other chairs and see if that's being done and um, also speak to Senator Sears. Uh, I'm not sure the scheduling is a little wonky in terms, you know, so but uh but yeah, no, I think it is. I think it is a good point. And uh, certainly, if we do take up, and I do hope we can take up uh, justice reinvestment too, that would be a um, a great time to hear from Mark and others. And Coach and I spoke earlier about um, about putting together a witness list um, as well. So, um, Eric, are you? Um, I don't know if you have any information in terms of what the Senate is 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 doing. If they're planning for next week yet, or. Uh, I haven't heard any planning for next week. They did um, this morning, the Senate Judiciary voted out uh, the sort of court's relief package, the COVID-19 related issues that has the uh, the power of attorney and the, um, the deeds language in it, as well as the other requests that the court has made as far as uh, ways to, you know, adapt the court process to to uh, the crisis that's going on right now. So I think that the, the thought there was, again, I'm not sure that they, they know when that will come out on the floor of the full Senate, but they did vote that out of Senate Judiciary this morning. So I know I think it's on your agenda for Thursday, if I remember correctly. Um, so uh, I know Bryn's been working on um, the finalization of that document. So once it's proofed and edited, you guys will be able to have that. And that's what we can work off when we walk you through it on Thursday. Um, but as far as next week goes, I, I haven't heard anything yet. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. And do you know if they kept the um, involuntary commitment, the extension of time for those hearings, do they keep that in? They did not. Okay. That that piece got taken out. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. I think so, yeah. Eric, is, is your impression, and I think this goes also to the... Um, the sentencing reconsideration, is your impression that um, only bills where there's true consensus, um, no opposition, that that's really what the, the Senate is, is focusing on and that things are coming out to either be done later or elsewhere, but, but not included? Yes, I think that's exactly right. The reason, the reason pieces like that one specifically, they discuss it in committee, the reason that it came out is because there was an anticipation that it could potentially be divisive on the floor and they, they don't want anything at, at this point Obviously, not saying never, but at this point, they don't want uh, um, things coming out on the floor that there isn't already general consensus about. So, they if they notice things that it looks like that's not the case, then they're setting them elsewhere, and that's um, the same. I think that they did with the, you know, the ninety day reduction and the uh, uh, people being able to the parties being able to agree about someone being released uh, or sorry, a reconsideration of sentence. Um, set those aside, they, they might well, and are still talking about taking them up in other bills and other legislation, but not as part of the ones that are trying to move more quickly uh, consensus-based items right now. Thank you, that's, it. that's helpful. Uh, sure. Anybody else? I, um, I do see that we have Jean Murray on Friday for um, Vermont Legal Aid, and I think she she might have been speaking about uh, about the involuntary 
uh, commitment hearings, but we could also ask her about uh, some of the family law questions and domestic violence questions that we heard we heard today. And I know Nader, you had also um, heard from a constituent regarding um, visitation. So I think I think we are hearing about those things that legal aid has been hearing about. So um, try to reach out to her and have her be prepared for that. So. Sounds good. Okay. Anybody else? I have one thing is if we're done. Um, absolutely. I mean, we're still on the record, but yeah, go ahead. Well, on the record, that's fine. That's fine. All right, that's fine. I'm sorry that not everybody can sing along with this because of the way it works, but. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Wait, I'm way off. Let me try it again. Happy birthday to you. Happy bur happy birthday to you. We can join in. Happy birthday, happy birthday dear, coach. dear coach. Happy birthday, happy birthday to, you. to you. That was terrible. You would have done better, Patrick. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Nice job. <laughs> well, Thank you, thanks Martin. a lot, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday, coach. Birthday, coach. Thank you all. Yeah, well, I'm sorry we're not with you in person, but I'm glad we're here with you today and can collectively wish you a happy birthday. So. Well, thanks. Great. Okay. Um, Tom, I see your hand up, but I don't know if it's because I didn't lower it oh. before. I, uh, you're good. No, that's from, yeah, that's from before. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, we're we're ahead of time, but that's that's okay. Just anybody, anybody else have anything? And certainly, if you think of anything afterwards, just let me know. But uh, yeah, I just had a question for Mike, and uh, where I can find this on YouTube, or what I would have to search for on YouTube to uh, repost this. It's on the committee webpage. If you just click the live stream link, all the videos are right there. Okay, great. Thank you. Cool. Yep. Okay. All right. Anybody else? No. Okay. Ready to go off the record? I just, um, I just want to say thank you to everybody uh, for, for your feedback and your support. I'm really <laughs> winging this, uh, and I think as we do it more, it'll get easier. And uh, I, what I find challenging is the, um, is the timing and making sure we, we give folks enough time. Uh, and also respect the fact that people are being pulled in a number of different directions. Um, and there are many, many folks that, that want their time as well. So just uh, please uh, keep your feedback coming and um, issues that you're interested in. And as much as I can keep you updated about scheduling, I think we'll see the speaker's office continue to schedule for, um, for us, but I'll get updated on that today at the chair's meeting. Uh, and I think that we're still focusing on quote unquote emergency uh, legislative responses, uh, which I know can be defined differently um, to different legislators, uh, but we'll, we'll keep, keep working um, as much as we can. So, anybody else? Nope. Maxine, just to double check, I, so we're on, it's 11 o'clock on Thursday, is that right? When we'll take up the, that's still the plan to take up uh, the, the other uh, COVID-19 related judiciary legislation. Right, exactly. So you'll quickly just, um, yeah, talk about the probate. Yeah. Um, right, and uh, and that the the language from the deed bill is not in the, just go over that, that that, that language is not in there. Sure. Uh, that, that um, and I think we'll hear from Terry also, and then we'll hear from Bryn. So yes, that's, that's what I have. Great, thanks. That's, and I uh, won't see you tomorrow, everybody. And uh, I guess that's it. All right. All so right. We're, um, let's go off the record. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. See you, yeah. See you Thursday. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Me. Have a good Thank day. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah. Take care, everybody. Thank Bye. You.